Hi everyone. This week in Physics 124, we're going to be studying the properties of a pendulum. The pendulum is one of those key first-year physics apparatuses, and it's really neat to actually see that we can get really good data about the acceleration due to gravity off of the pendulum. To construct your pendulum, you're going to need a length of string or dental floss or thread. I'm using dental floss here. And a small heavy mass. A little piece of metal will be good. Fridge magnet. I'm using some magnetized ball bearings. That's okay. Just any piece of metal. Doesn't have to be a magnet. You'll also need measurement tools. You'll need a smartphone or something else to make timing measurements. A stopwatch would be good. Uh, we want to make measurements accurate to the hundredth of a second. And finally, you'll need a P, uh, measurement device. Here, I'm just going to be using a tape measure because we need to measure the length here from the pivot point down to the center of mass for the swinging uh, metal at the bottom. We're going to refer to the thing at the metal uh, the thing of metal at the bottom as the bob. It's just what we call it. The pendulum has a bob on the bottom of it. Eh, physics words. Who knows? All right, let's talk a little bit how we're going to go through the theory and then the procedure. As a physicist, I find the pendulum to be one of the most interesting first-year physics problems we encounter. This is mainly because for the general solution, there is no simple answer. It's one of the first really unsolvable problems in physics. But that doesn't mean we can't get anywhere. This diagram here on the left is showing us the variables that we'll be using in a pendulum. The pendulum consists of a small mass that we'll call a bob that is attached to a string of length L. The string is light, which means it's massless and inextensible, so it's always that same length L. We're going to pull it back from its starting position by some angle, theta naught, and then release it, and it's going to swing back and forth across uh, the plane, and at some time the position relative to the vertical is going to be called the angle theta. If we go ahead and pull back that angle to a small angle, and I'm going to say that a small angle here means about 10 degrees, for reference, this angle here is 10 degrees, so really not very far off the vertical, and then release it, we can actually find a solution. And that solution says that for those small starting angles, the period of oscillation is equal to root two, or is two pi times the square root of this length divided by g. The mass of the bob doesn't enter into it, only the length of that string, which is what makes it such a powerful tool for measuring g. All we have to do is measure timing and the length of the string. We'll do that by linearizing this equation. If I solve the equation for L, I get that L is equal to g over four pi squared times t squared plus zero and then you can make the mapping to our standard y equals mx plus b form, and the slope of this relationship, l versus t squared, is going to have a, uh, have a slope that is g over 4 pi squared, or is going to depend on the value of g. Sidebar, we're just going to assume that pi is 3.14159. We're not going to go measure a bunch of uh, circles to determine that physical constant. Just take it as it is. Okay, we're going to measure multiple swings to reduce our error. Uh, this really allows us to make our timing error better. And that's because we're going, when we measure time, in this case with a stopwatch, we are going to measure the time for some number of swings. N could be one, it could be three, it could be 10. We're going to calculate the average period during that time as T is the time it takes to measure N swings and divide that by the total number of swings. So it gives us the average period. But what's super cool about this is the error in the period, we'll call that little delta t, is going to be equal to the error in time divided by n. This means for more numbers of swings, the error just gets smaller and smaller. So if I take 10 swings, my error is going to be 10 times better than if I'm just trying to use the stopwatch to measure a single swing. That's why I encourage you to measure at least three, if not 10 swings, to get your uh, average period for a certain length of the string. Our procedure is going to look like this. We're going to first use a stopwatch to determine our personal timing error. Then we're going to set up the pendulum. We'll measure the length from the pivot point to the center of mass of the bob. 
We're going to make the period measurement for that length three times, and then we will test five different lengths. So we'll have a total of 15 data points uh, when we're done, at least. Feel free to take more. For the first part of the procedure, we should establish our timing error when using a stopwatch. This is my stopwatch on my phone, and the way to establish the timing error is to try to measure five seconds exactly. So I can start and then try to stop this exactly on five seconds. So I just wait and hit it, and this would be a four hundredths of a second error. So I'd record 4.96, reset, and take another data point. So go through, wait for it to count up and try to hit five exactly. Here, a little earlier, and I'd write down 4.88. So I'm going to take all of those and record the data for 10 separate trials. You can also be smart and go ahead and just use the lap button uh, up to 10 times, and then just record it every 10 times. And it'll record each lap as a separate unit of time. So here at 5.96, 4.48, Etc. And that will go ahead and give you the time that you need to calculate your timing error. Next, we're going to go ahead and collect data. You'll want to set up your pendulum to a single length, and you're going to want to go ahead and measure the distance from the central pivot point to the middle of the pendulum's bob. So in this case, I'll just measure from the pivot point down there, and it looks like it's about 27 inches, which I'll have to convert to metric uh, since I'm just using a construction tape measure here, convert that to metric for my analysis. Then I need to get out my timer, and I'm going to time 10 full oscillations for the pendulum bob. And to do that, I'm going to pull it back a small angle from the vertical, no more than about 10 degrees, so about there. And then I'm just going to release it and count 10 full oscillations when I start timing. Ready? Go. One. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I'm going to stop that, and I got 16.4 seconds, so that means a single period here is 16.4 divided by 10, or 1.64 seconds. So this completes one trial. To take another trial of data, what I need to do is go ahead and change the length of the pendulum. So I can just take uh, some loops here and put them up and shorten the length of the string. And then I have a shorter pendulum. And then all I have to do is pull it back a small angle and set to timing again. One, two, three, etc. oscillations. And you'll notice I've shortened the string so the period of the oscillation is now shorter. So we'll need to collect this at five different string lengths. Uh, and then we'll go ahead and collect three trials at each string length and use those 15 data points or more if you want to, to measure the acceleration due to gravity. Let's go ahead and look at our data to see how that turns out. The first part of the analysis is to calculate the timing error. These are 10 trials of me trying to measure five seconds exactly on the stopwatch and failing. What I'll do is I'll use the standard deviation function to define my errors. And I'll just type equals STDEV, open bracket, then I'll select the 10 data points and hit return. That gives me my timing error, 0.11. Uh, at such a seconds, or to one significant figure, that's a timing error of 0.1 seconds. I'll use that in my actual data. And if I come over here, you'll notice I've already entered in my timing error as 0.1 seconds. Here, I have recorded the uh, value for the length. Uh, I measured in inches, and I used the metric conversion to turn it into meters. I have the time that I actually measured in seconds. I have the number of swings that I measured, in this case 10, and I have the period, which is just what happens when I take the number of the time divided by n. So you'll notice this column is just equal to d4 divided by 10, or 1.753 seconds. 
I also estimate that I had a length error of 0.1 inches, and therefore my length error in meters is 0.0254. I'm going to round that to 0.003, and then I'm going to take this column and correct its uh, numbers of decimal places till I have one decimal place uh, in the uncertainty and everything else is rounded to that same place value. Similarly for the length here, I want that to have one significant digit in the errors and everything else rounded to that value. My time error is going to be 0.1 seconds, so I can pull that back. I need to have the whole column, so let's pull that back until I get 0.1 seconds. Uh, and and then my period in time is going to have an error of one-tenth of my timing error here, 0 0.1, so that's 0 0.01 seconds. And so I'm going to bring that back, and there's my period. I need to calculate the uh, column for my linearization, so I need the period squared. And so that's going to have units of seconds squared. Don't worry about the errors here. Uh, we're not going to be too concerned with that. Uh, they would vary for each of the numbers. And then I'm going to go ahead and say that this is equal to the period uh, squared, and then paste that on down, and I have my values. Now I want to make a chart. Uh, so I want to insert my uh, time and period squared as my two variables. Uh, the problem is, is that my unit and my error column are going to mess things up, so I'm going to just slide those down and park them out of the way just for a little bit of physics. Don't mind me. So I want the length, but just to that point. And I also want the period squared. So I'll take those two columns and I'll insert a chart and I get a useless uh, bar chart. I'm going to turn that into uh, the variables that I want. Uh, the big issue here is that it's length on the x-axis and period squared on the y-axis. That is, in fact, the opposite of what I want, so I'll switch uh, those two, and that'll give me my graph, and so we have a nice linear relationship here. And then the other thing that I want to do, I can then uh, gussy that up and turn it into a proper physics graph, and here we'll go ahead and we'll measure with Linust the uh, slope of this relationship. So my y data uh, is that range of the length. My x data is period squared. And as ever, I want to type true, true uh, to get my answers. There's my stats. This answer is the slope, but that is not the value of g. Uh, clearly, maybe the g on Pluto, but here it is just the g on Earth. We need to take that value and multiply it by 4 times pi squared. To get pi in a spreadsheet program, you just type pi, open bracket, close bracket, and that calls pi, and then I want to square that value. So there's my g. Oh, 9.44 meters per second squared. Pretty good for an honest day of work. I also want the uncertainty, which is this value here. It's the error right below, is right below the slope, and multiply that by 4 times pi squared. And that'll give me my uh, uncertainty. So it's close to, but is going to be a few error intervals off of the accepted value. I also noticed that my intercept here is within one standard error, uh, or one standard, uh, or one error range of zero, which is actually quite good since I expect it to be zero. This should give you everything you need to complete your study of the pendulum. After you're finished with the analysis, you can log into eClass upload your results, and answer a few questions there to complete the assignment. Thanks for watching.